You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension, a dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. In the beginning was the Word, and darkness, and light. I have trouble remembering light. Some of it shines through my eyelids, so I know it's there, but all I really see is darkness now. There are pinpoints of light, like holes in the fabric of space. I know they're out there, even if I can't quite see them. When will I? Time no longer has meaning, as if it has stopped for me, closing in, contracting, and I can't move, not a muscle. But in this moment, the mind continues, and I wait. Stansfield, Douglas, scanning Bible signs. Life functions, check. Metabolism, stable. Temperature. Constant. No adjustments necessary. Only the mind. The mind is memory. And I remember things. They remain to it all. There is more than just darkness. The void. The mind does work. I wonder if they know that. The images are constant. Ever-present patterns to savor again and again. It's not just the long sleep that comes when the fear has left. It's a time to recollect, sift, and analyze. Try to understand all that's happened in this infinite moment. It may be said with a degree of assurance that not everything is as it appears. Case in point, the scene you're witnessing. You are not in a hospital. You are in the belly of a spaceship. It is currently en route to another galaxy located an incredible distance from the Earth. This is the crux of our story, the truth behind the mystery flight into deep space. For here, distances are so vast that they are marked in light years instead of miles while a man's life ticks by in the blink of an eye. It is the story of events that might happen to human beings who, with the help of technology, dare to take a step beyond and are unable to anticipate all that awaits them out there. So fasten your safety belts, because you're on a spaceship. You're already well on your way on a very long journey from one planet to another, and the vast region between is called the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, The Long Morrow, starring Kathy Garver with Stacy Keach as your narrator. The cold is felt, but without pain. The loss of feeling is noted and accepted as choice slips away. Now mind is all. Time is distorted, jumbled, telescoped, accordioned. But even so, there is a strong sense of time. And I remember. I remember how it began. I remember the way it was in the beginning. How am I doing? Heart rate 84, 88, 90, and holding. Speed five miles an hour. That's excellent, Commander. Let's see how long I can sustain it. Eh, that's enough treadmill. I can keep going for as long as you want. We know you can. Give it a rest, Commander. You're not a hamster in a cage. Whew. I can beat any hamster you've got. Eh, I'll bet. We prefer rabbits, though. 
Why don't you shower up and grab some lunch? What's the schedule this afternoon? Just some blood tests. Again? Uh, you know the routine. Check your cholesterol, blood sugar. Take any more blood and I'll dry up and float away. You know who Dracula was, Sherry? Yep, some guy who worked for NASA. Commander Stansfield to Dr. Pixler's lab. Commander Douglas Stansfield, report to the flight director's lab. Tell them I'm on my way. After you shower. Forget it. I didn't even break a sweat. Come in. Dr. Bixler? Hello, Commander. Glad to meet you, if somewhat belatedly. Please make yourself comfortable. Oh, thanks. A figure of speech, in the sense that there's no need to stand on ceremony. I'm sorry there are no comfortable chairs here. Oh, that's all right. I'd just as soon stand. Even after this morning's workout. But, of course, your cardiovascular rating is superb. So, this is where the commandments come from. Commandments? Mission directives. I've heard much of you, the mysterious Dr. Bixler. And I of you. And that's the reason you're here. I was wondering. I guess this all seems faintly ridiculous to you, the hush-hush aspect. Well, all NASA's projects are secret during the planning stages, but I've been here six months now. In the past, I knew what I was training for. Is there a reason I've been kept in the dark so long? Perhaps so you wouldn't hand in your resignation. <laughs> Not likely. I knew what I signed on for when I joined the agency. You knew some of it, what we've done up to now. I take it on faith. It's work I believe in, ever since I was a boy. You've been with us for 11 years. Is that a question, sir? More along the lines of an observation. Should you not have realized it, you've been the object of considerable observation over the past several months. I'm well aware of that, but if I may say so, I've never been the subject of so many tests. Not just physical, but psychological. There are reasons, Commander. Rather good reasons. What is it you have in mind for me? Or is that still hush-hush? This one is not official yet. Or it wasn't until we knew we had the right man for the job. It's not part of the budget we submitted to Congress, but... I think we're about ready for a formal announcement. Of what? You've made 11 separate orbital flights. That's right. You orbited the moon, commanded a lunar landing, you're oldest of the astronauts, and you're also the most experienced and the most knowledgeable. I don't know about that. I do. Certainly if we count those who are still active. May I ask you a personal question? Why? You already know everything about me. Not quite. <clears throat> Why did you never marry? <laughs> well, that's easy. I never found someone who could put up with me. The months spent in training for a mission, the flight time. There's no woman in the world who could live with that. No, I suppose not. Though several of your fellow astronauts have families. They lucked out. I guess I just never met the right one. You dated in college. You were even engaged once. For about 15 minutes. <laughs> Once she found out the way I live, on call, at a moment's notice, well, you might say she came to her senses, very fortunately for her. Mm. When the space agency put me on this project, I was told to keep in mind the scientific problems, of which there are a great many, I can guarantee. I'm sure. But also to be aware of the human factor, and that's where you come in, Commander Stansfield. You're the human factor. May I ask you a question? By all means. How long are you going to keep me in suspense? Not much longer, I promise. You recognize this, don't you? A chart of the solar system. That's right. The sun, the earth down here, our neighbors, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and so forth, and the moons that orbit them. A lot of places I haven't been to yet. What do we know about our neighbors, Commander? More than we knew a few years ago. Oh, yes. Thanks to men like you. Nonetheless, what it boils down to is this. The moon is barren. Mars is a vast, scrubby desert with an unbreathable atmosphere. Venus and Jupiter, both gaseous and poisonous. Pluto and the outer planets are volcanic. In short, our neighbors have only one asset to offer us. They're accessible. They can be reached using current technology. Beyond that, they offer us nothing scientific, social, economic, by any standards. They're the Mount Everest of near space. You go to them because they're there. But the accomplishment is in the climb, and once climbed, 
There are no more challenges. So, where's the next Mount Everest, Doctor? That may be the wisest question you've ever asked, and the most pertinent. Why do you say that? Take a look at this chart. It's a star system in a galaxy well beyond our reach, to date seen only through the lens of a telescope. We know nothing of it with absolute certainty, except that there is a cluster of six planetary bodies. Where? Here. Toward the edge of the picture, the small, extremely bright object at the center is a sun, very similar to ours. It's flaming and gaseous and almost exactly the same color temperature. It provides heat and light for these five objects here. The ingredients of a solar system like ours, only a bit smaller. The planets run in roughly the same paths as we do around our own sun. Yes, yes, I see. The, the equivalent of our five inner planets. But the rest, you can tell all that? Our astrophysicists can. The distances bear approximately the same relationship to each other as Mercury, Venus, the Earth, Mars, and Jupiter. And given that relationship, this is the most likely system we've found yet that might support life. Are you telling me we've made contact? Not yet. The distances are too vast. Even if they've sent out an intelligent communication, it would take a very long time for it to reach us, assuming we could pick it up on our frequencies and decipher it. You and I would be dead and gone by then, or they would. There are too many variables. This system, does it have a name? Only a number. We've nicknamed it Sol 2 for purposes of identification, but for now, you can call it anything you want. For example, Stansfield's Everest. That's where I'm going. That's where you're going. When? In about a month. The ship is under construction now. It's off the drawing boards, and the keel, so to speak, is being laid. It must be the size of a skyscraper. Not necessary. It'll only carry a crew of one. One? That's because of the weight, the extra equipment on board. What kind of equipment? I'll get to that in a moment. For now, I believe the man who flies her should be right there while she's being built to watch every bolt, every rivet, every screw, every piece of metal and circuitry going into it. And that man is you, Commander. You'll be its pilot and its only occupant. You'll truly be the captain of your fate. Not that it matters at this point, but I want you to know, I like this assignment. I like it very much. That's not surprising, considering your profile. It's precisely why you've been chosen. I've put together a manual of projections and probabilities. I think you ought to see it. I'll read it tonight. There are the usual dangers, the usual unknowns. It was ever thus. No, Commander, it was never thus. How so? In the past, you've had meteor storms to contend with. You've had the usual calculated risks of mechanical failure, landing difficulties, ejection troubles, all the rest. Well, you'll still have those compounded. There's another factor here, another problem. Distance. Distance. In time and in space. How far? This cluster is approximately 141 light years away. But that means the ship would have to... An ordinary ship. This one will have interstellar drive and an anti-gravity device. It'll be the fastest man-made object ever conceived and launched. Its speed will be like... like nothing ever dreamed of before. But in terms of the space you have to conquer, it might just as well be an ant crawling across the Sahara. <sighs> It's a high mountain, isn't it, Dr. Bixler? A very high mountain. The highest, the longest trip in the history of mankind. How long? Your trip there and back will take approximately 35 to 40 years. Well, at least it's a round trip. Consider it carefully, Commander. When you return from this trip, the Earth will have aged almost half a century. Oh, that's... that's something to contemplate, isn't it? I'll be 60, 70 years old. I'll have lived the better part of my life out in space. Alone. You'll have lived the better part of your life, but you'll not have aged. 
we intend to try something different, also a risk, also decidedly calculated, that's where the extra equipment comes in. Freezing? An extension of cryonics, but considerably more complicated. It will be suspended animation in its purest form. We've developed a substance from the lymphoid tissue of hibernating animals, several antioxidant absorbents, and a collection of experimental drugs to slow down metabolism. The Earth will age, Commander, but you will not. You'll only be a few weeks older when you return. Sort of like... sort of like dying, and then coming to life again. After a fashion, coming to life again in the sense that there'll be very few people here you'll know or who'll know you. Life will have changed in many ways, Commander, and you'll have to begin living it all over again as a stranger, as, as an anachronism, if you will. If you'll forgive this degree of candor, it's one assignment I don't envy very much. That's pretty much been the story of my life, Dr. Bixler. Assignments that not very many people would envy. When do I begin? You already have begun. If you're free this afternoon, I'd like to go over the preliminaries. Tomorrow, there's a chartered jet to the Cape where you'll begin your briefing and have a first look at the ship. Unless you care to reconsider. I'll be there. I'm on the payroll, aren't I? When I checked in, it was all the way. Good. That's good, my boy. Glad to have you aboard. And so it began, that brief, unemotional, very matter-of-fact colloquy between scientist and subject, a small cast of two characters. That was the way it should have been. But I remember, I very clearly remember, the entrance of character number three. Oh, excuse me. Oh, my fault. You've dropped your papers. Here, let me help you. Commander Stansfield? Excuse me for staring, but I see your ID badge. Why, why you're... You're the one. I don't know whether to thank you for that or report you for insubordination. Forgive me. We've been hearing Stansfield, Stansfield, Stansfield for close to a year. I was beginning to think that you weren't real. Let me give you a hand. A friend in need. That's my job. Picking up papers? Oh, that's my new assignment. Morale officer. I follow people around who look stricken. Do I look stricken? Momentarily nonplussed. I don't think we've met. No, we haven't. That's what I was saying. You stationed permanently here? I'm with NASA, on detached duty. I've always wanted to meet you. And I you. Oh, no, that I don't believe. It's true. I've got ESP. A long time ago, I woke up and an inner voice told me, with some intensity, that I'd meet a woman with a stricken look who drops papers in corridors. Did your ESP give you the name? Hmm... Let's see. It's coming to me. The first letter is an S. Sandra. Sandra Horn. How did you... Oh, of course. My name badge. <laughs> I didn't look at it, I swear. <laughs> sure you didn't. Very subtle. It's been an honor meeting you. Strange. What is? Nothing. Tell me. It's, uh... It's not a line, I promise, but I do feel I've known you. I know. There was a, a little girl in fourth grade. She sat in front of me. I used to stick pencils in her red hair. Tell me the truth. That was you, wasn't it? I went to an all-girls school. Oh. I don't suppose... Yes? I don't suppose uh, the National Space Agency could do without your services for, say, a couple of hours this evening. Long enough for a dinner? I think... Despite the fact that I'm invaluable and the whole space program rests on my shoulders, a two- or three-hour period might be carved out. I'm in the book, Commander. 
Please phone me. I won't phone. I'll pick you up. What kind of food do you like? Any kind. Partial to beef. Also seafood. No shellfish, though. Chinese, Italian, you name it. I'll plan the itinerary and the menu. See you at eight. Arrivederci, lady from the space agency. Eight o'clock, then, astronaut. Arrivederci to you, too. I stood there and watched her walk away. I thought we talked for an hour, not minutes. And I knew everything I needed to know about her, even then. The only time in my life it had ever happened to me. And now I return to these things, these simple things. Now in the darkness, and the cold, the solitude. The stillness without measure. I remember. Music, colors, and a voice. How did you like the meal? Hmm? The food. Food? Oh, oh, it was wonderful, truly. But you've hardly touched it. Well, yes, I have. I mean, I had a late lunch. I guess I'm not as hungry as I thought. Well, look at you. You haven't cleaned your plate either, mister. Oh, I was thinking. About what? Do you dance? Oh, no, not really. Neither do I. Never learned how. Oh, come on. I missed all the dances at school, even the prom. I don't believe that for one minute. Would I lie to you? I really don't know. You can teach me. What? Just the basic two-step or whatever they call it. You're asking the wrong person. Am I? Besides, they wouldn't let us dance in here. They wouldn't notice. A couple of duffers like us. Quick, don't look. How many people at the next table? I haven't noticed. My point exactly. They don't care about us either. Stand up. Oh, I couldn't. You're looking at me. Sorry. Something wrong? It's just that... A month from now, you'll be off in space. And by the time you come back down again... You want to talk about that now? Only for the following absurd reason. I've known you for exactly three and a half hours. Is that all it's been? That's all. Three and a half hours. A long dinner and a short dance. And already... Already... Already what, Sandy? Already, I feel a sense of loss. My life had been in the military. Always first aircraft, then space vehicles. And it had been missions projects and expeditions. There was no time for another kind of life. Intrusions that took the form of a face, a voice, a short month lived by a man and a woman drawing closer and closer together and finally becoming a part of one another. There's so little time for such a thing, for such a small thing. And then what time we had ran out and slipped away. Rechecking fuel supply. Fuel supply? Check. Testing rockets. Mark it from five. Mark. Five, four, three, two, one. Calibrate fuel consumption. Fuel flow at point two five and holding. Check and double check. All systems go. T minus one twenty. Setting countdown, Dr. Bixler. Only two more hours. Where is he? He'll be here. Man, oh man, I sure wish I was him. Do you? Well, why not? That kind of adventure? All the way to another galaxy? Quite a price to pay. Oh, sure, it costs a fortune. But think of it. One man in the whole of history going out into space with... with a key, you could say. 
a key to unlock all the, the mysteries. I'm beginning to think that not all mysteries are out there. One man, and for the right to have his adventure, our adventure, for the ritual of turning that key, he pays for it as no man has ever paid before. With all of his friends, his well-being, his sense of belonging, maybe even his sanity. Everything on earth that has meaning for him will now be just a memory. And you envy him? I guess he is to be envied. I envy him too. But what I don't envy is his homecoming. Sandy? Hello, Doug. I thought we agreed. I know, but I had to see you. It only makes it harder. I wanted to give you something. A small, unofficial gesture from one of the lesser bureaucrats of our good, gray, respectable government. Sandy. Unofficial, and very much apart from protocol. But I couldn't let you leave, Doug. Not without saying goodbye. Not without telling you that I loved you very much, that I shall sorely miss you, that my life, whatever is left of it, will be a strangely meaningless, dull and empty place without you to share it. No. Shh, shh, shh. And this last paragraph. I wouldn't say this to you if I didn't know you were the kind of man you are. If I thought it would even remotely affect you, or at least what you plan to do, I wouldn't say any of this. But I know you. I know that you're built out of a very strong alloy, and you may bend a little, but you'll never break. It's a very odd thing, Sandy. Very odd. But when I come back, when I touch this ground again... I know the first thought I'll have. I know the first thing it is I'll want to see. The very first... The first thing I'll want to touch. I'll be the little old lady in the lace shawl. The one waving the welcome home sign. So look for me, Doc, will you? Look for me on the fringe of the crowd. I'll be... I'll be the one carrying the sign. And how much we had become a part of one another. Despite the circumstances of both our lives. Despite everything rational. We let ourselves reach into that strange and mysterious sea within us called love. And then watch the ripples grow. Sandy. Sandy, where are you now? Sandy. Across the void, my dearest. Through the millions of miles of cold and empty space. Through the vastness of a naked desert of sky and stars. I feel your warmth. And I love you. I love you, Sandy. Final countdown. Mark it. All systems, one hand, three quarters. We have full admission. Blast off. I move now. I streak across the heavens. I leave behind an earth that changes even now beyond my closed eyes. This, then, is the hero's journey. From a warm place of leaves and trees and summers full of dreaming to a cold orb hanging in a dark sky in a place I do not know. To return one day with stories to tell my tribe on the rock they call home. I feel it growing smaller and smaller and smaller, and time passes, inexorably and eternally. 
And I can do nothing about it. Nothing at all. Commander Stansfield. Douglas. Scanning vital signs. Life functions. Check. Metabolism. Stable. Return mission. On course. Re-entering Earth's solar system. Prepare for approach. Initiate signal transmission. And now it ends where it began. Time without measure reduced to a single point of light. I see it. The blue seas wrapped in clouds. A flash of green showing through. Where humankind sits on a rock and waits for the word from above. Or perhaps they do not wait. Perhaps they have forgotten. But I have not. I am he who waits like a rock. Earth, I feel you near me. As this comes in, so much loneliness will go anywhere. And something else, old and yet new, returns to fill the void. I feel you. I feel her. Mission control. Mission control. Come in. What's this? Where? On the trivet. Looks like a craft on the approach. Yeah, I see it, but what kind of craft? Could be a missile. Activate the defense shields. Setting coordinates. Locked on. Lasers on standby. This is gonna be easy. Almost too easy. Whoever he is, he's a sitting duck. Wait a minute. Look at the shape of that thing. Some kind of retro design. Hey, bring it up on the hell screen. I can almost make out the numbers. Run a pattern recognition. That'll nail down the model and country of origin. Scanning for recognition. Yes? General Walters, spacecraft re-entry, sir. Satellite of origin? That's just it, sir. It wasn't launched from orbit. Then from where? Unknown. It's spiraling into the atmosphere. Spiraling? Patch me into visual. Yes, sir. Good Lord. What, sir? I've seen this one before. Running a configuration ID, it's definitely one of ours. By the markings, it's a ship called... The Soul Two. The prototype is at the Smithsonian, commanded by... I've got the stats. Somebody named Stansfield. Douglas Stansfield. Yeah, this is a real odd one, sir. It date of departure was 40 years ago. 41 to be exact. You're not going to believe this, but he was a hero of mine when I was a boy. Send in Vogler. Tell him to search everything we've got in the files. Right away, sir. It's downloading now, General. Who is he, anyway? One of the pioneers. Been in space several decades. Really? Presumed lost a long time ago. Put it on the screen. Here's a report. He's been out of contact. This is the first communication we've had. The date, the log entries. He was tracked on radar when he left Earth space. But communications must have malfunctioned a few hours after he left the ionosphere. 41 years. And now they come back. Every month, every year, they keep coming back. Like aging birds returning to a nest. For what? That's the question. They went off on missions that became obsolete almost the moment they were out of sight. To blaze trails we've already charted by now. To bring back discoveries that aren't discoveries anymore. And still, they keep coming back. Burnt. Dented. Aged. And they keep coming back. Look at this. What? The footnote. This is a funny one. Let me see. There's an item inserted from a man named Bixler. Bixler? As I recall, he was one of the project people years and years ago. He probably handled the Stansfield mission. It says we're to contact a Miss Sandra Horn. Who's that? Sandra Horn. A friend of Commander Stansfield. And where would we find her, sir? In an old folks home? According to this, you'll find her in the hibernation room. 
a young woman of approximately 26 years of age. She must have been very much in love with him, very devoted, a devotion without precedent. Say a prayer, son. A prayer, sir? That we find her alive. General Walters? Miss Horn, you look very well. Do I? You look just fine, which may sound idiotic. But what do I say to someone who's just had a 40 year sleep? I was told... I was told Commander Stansfield... Commander Stansfield's ship landed six hours ago. I asked to see you first. What about Commander Stansfield? In good health. Naturally very tired. I want to see him. I must see him. You shall see him. But I had to talk to you. Is... is something the matter? I'll make this as brief as possible. Commander Stansfield had a communications failure. It occurred probably within the first 12 hours of his departure. There was only sporadic contact made during his entire flight, there and back. He reached the other galaxy. He reached it, he landed, he took off, he returned. There was no life where he went. We found that out ourselves 20 years ago. One of the ironies of our progress. We could have saved him the trip. We could have saved him. His anguish. I don't understand. His anguish being the following, Miss Horn. Unknown to us here or to my predecessors or theirs, due to the lack of communication, Stansfield arbitrarily removed himself from hibernation six months after leaving Earth. He did this because... because... I know why he did it. God help me. I know why. Over 40 years, Miss Horn. 40 years in the cockpit of a ship. 40 years of... Well... His kind of loneliness must have been something brand new in human experience. For what you both gave up, you deserve far better than this. I wish to God... I wish to God he could have come back to you just as he was when he left. But as it is, I'll leave you alone now. Doc? Dear Doc. You, you remember me, don't you? Remember you? I've spent 40 years remembering you, Sandy. I've spent 40 years painting your picture inside my head, remembering your voice, thinking about your touch. I've spent 40 years surviving for you. But it looks like I made a miscalculation, an error of judgment, you might say, with the best of intentions. And now... Doug, it can still be that way. What you are, what I am, it doesn't make any difference. Oh, I'm afraid it makes a difference, Sandy. Look at you. Forty years of difference. And that's far too much. I'm sorry. I'm so desperately sorry. I know, my dear. I had a lot of years to ponder the possibilities. But I didn't consider this one. Years that I didn't think would ever pass. Years that I sometimes wished wouldn't pass. Oh, Doug. You're as beautiful as ever. Very beautiful. Don't waste it. Go away now, Sandy. You must, please, go home and pick up the pieces of the rest of your life. Go. If that's what you want. It's what I want. Goodbye, my love.
Mr. Dansfield. If I may say so, you're an incredible man. Really, quite an incredible man. It may be the one distinction I can point to in my entire life. That I knew you. That I knew a man who placed such a premium on love. Truly, truly, Stansfield. Quite a distinction. Goodbye, General. Commander Douglas Stansfield, one of the forgotten pioneers in the space age, pushed aside by the flow of progress and the passage of years. Our tale of irony and the ionosphere and the ferocious travesty of fate that could only happen in the Twilight Zone. More from the Twilight Zone after this. You are about to enter another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land of imagination. Next stop, the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Stacy Keach. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our Twilight Zone website at twilightzoneradio.com. At twilightzoneradio.com, you'll find the latest information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas, including behind-the-scenes photographs, plus the newest product releases, trivia contests, ways to contact us, other Twilight Zone-related info and merchandise, plus links to other fascinating websites. So make your next stop, TwilightZoneRadio.com. Visit TwilightZoneRadio.com to purchase these Twilight Zone radio dramas on cassette and CD, or call toll-free 1-866-989-ZONE. That's 1-866-989-9663. The Long Morrow, starring Kathy Garver with Stacy Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and based on a script by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Roderick Peoples, Christian Stolte, Rich Kominick, Jeff Lupatin, Meg Falcon, Heath Corson, Susan Hart, Carl Amari, Roger Wolski, and Vince Amari. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of the Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, XM Satellite Radio, the American Forces Radio and Television Service, Sirius Satellite Radio, our sponsors, and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking.